Hello, my name is G.K. Ganesan and I'm a practicing lawyer at Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Today's topic is better pleadings. I have subdivided this subject into 12 different areas. The first area would be pleading a statement of claim. The second area would be pleading a defense and a counterclaim. And the third area would be matters that you should think about when your pleadings reach the highest appellate court. Uh, as regards the first part, I should first be speaking about the reference material that you should have at hand. The second thing is you should check some fundamental points. The third would be what relief you should ask for, including inter interlocutory relief. For example, search orders, disclosures, injunctions, and so forth. And then we come to that very detailed portion on the causes of action. I've given two examples. One is a breach of contract. I've explained how you plead that. The second is a breach of tortious duties. I've given examples. I deal with other matters. Then I go on to the quite important area about how to plead in your statement of claim if you wish to divide your claim into two parts. One is for summary judgment. You want to sign judgment straight away by an application. And the other is by trial. I've given both these some treatment. I've also spoken about being mindful of the defenses the other side will take. I've spoken about other prejudices that you will suffer. Then I've spoken about which court you must file this claim or this defense because what relief you can ask for depends on which court you approach. And then there is a short discussion of how to file a defense and a counterclaim and any reply. So, the first thing that you have to have next to you is reference material. You should have the relevant parliamentary act. You should have the relevant textbooks concerning the kind of area that you wish to plead. For example, if you wish to plead a breach of contract, obviously you must have next to you the Contracts Act or textbooks relating to the law of contract. The two other references that are always with me at all times of the day are Bullen and Leak on pleadings. I prefer the 13th edition, although the 14th and 15th editions and the 16th editions are useful. They tell you what are the latest forms of pleading. The one particular set of reports and journals that I found most useful to me were Atkins forms. Atkins forms are a series of forms that will tell you how to plead certain kinds of causes of action when you run into difficulties with technicalities. And there are examples at the back and forms which you should follow. It has been of very great assistance to me and I suggest that you look at it. The last thing that I would want you to look at is an old book. I think it's called Odges on Pleading. And that has been very useful to me. Now let's move on to the second subject checking fundamental points, please ensure before you sue somebody of two matters. First, that you are not out of time, that limitation hasn't expired. For example, if you're suing someone today, then the cause of action must have accrued at least six years before today. Anything further than that, older than that, is dead in the water. The second thing that you must understand is who are the defendants and where do they live? If they live out of the country, then you shall have to think about serving the root out of jurisdiction and all the difficulties that come with it. If you are suing someone within the state and you are in one state and the person is on another state, living in another state, then you shall have to think about where you should sue them and generally you must go and sue the defendant where the defendant lives. You cannot put the defendant uh, to inconvenience by forcing the defendant to come to you.
Of course, if the defendant lives in the same state as you, then there is no problem. That, I think, are the fundamental points that you have to check. The third point I would like you to think about is relief. Most people start pleading and go straight to parties. And I have found in so many decades of my practice as a lawyer that that is not a good idea. The first thing that you should ask yourself is, what is the relief do you want from the court? For example, if you want to tell the court that you're a beneficiary to a trust, then you have to tell the court to give you, can you please give me a declaration? And I say this all the time to my lawyers in our firm when they come to train with us. If you want rights to be established in a suit, the first thing that you ask in a statement of claim is you ask for declaration of rights. You ask for a declaration either that the defendant is a trustee and that you are a beneficiary and that he has breached the trust. The second thing that you should think about are interlocutory orders. Sometimes when you file a writ against someone or a suit against someone, the first thing that you would want is an injunction to restrain the person from doing certain things. And so if you are going to plead injunctions, you have to think about the fundamentals of injunctions and you have to think about the formulaic words that are at the back of the rules of court which you are required to use in your relief. You've got to use those words and you might want to have to give in the body of your pleadings um, an undertaking as to damages. And if you are asking for an injunction, you must be as narrow and as precise as possible. You cannot ask the court for a very generally worded injunction because the courts will not give you an order that is too broad. Therefore, think about those things. The next thing that you have to think about is damages. Some damages can be quantified and other damages cannot be quantified. They have to be proven by evidence. Those damages that can be quantified precisely are called special damages and you will not get special damages unless you specifically plead for special damages. So do not forget that. As far as general damages are concerned, please remember you have to give particulars of your pleadings about damages, what damages you've suffered, how long you've suffered, what is the approximate quantum so that the court and the defendant, when they read your pleadings, have some idea about what is involved. The next thing that you should worry about in your relief is costs. When you ask for costs, you have to explain to the court whether you want a solicitor client cost, which is the higher scale or the party and party cost, which is the general scale on which the court always grant costs. If you don't specify, the court will automatically give you party and party costs. And the general rule is party and party costs are usually only two thirds of a solicitor client costs. So remember that. The next thing that you should remember is you may have different kinds of damages and you have to ask for costs on all sums due. If you are the plaintiff and you're acting for the bank, obviously there are two different kinds of interests. The interests that are due on the loan from the time the default occurred up to the point you go and file your claim in court and the second period of interest will be the interest awarded under the Act for suits filed in court. Remember that when you ask for interest, you be specific. Generally, I will ask, for example, if I'm suing for a sum of money and it's based on a contract like a loan document or an overdraft document, I will inform the court about the duration of the interest from the breach to the filing. It will be one set of costs from the filing to the due payment after judgment is given would be a second period. Then you have to remember a third thing which most people forget. When you ask for costs, is it not true that if costs are ordered and the defendant delays in paying back the costs, interest accrues 
Of course, the law allows that. And what you do need to do is to inform the court that you need interest on cost. Now, there are other orders that you may ask for. For example, if the person is a trustee, you may ask that person to account or make disclosure or to appoint receivers and managers. You have to look at the rules about what these things are, how they have to be pleaded, what has to be satisfied and make sure all of them go into the pleading. And then there is a final part in a pleading if you look at it in a claim. It will be what is called a residual relief and it will sound something like this, such further or other relief directions or orders as the court deems fit and necessary. Well, these are things that the parties have been thought about at the time they filed and therefore they ask for other directions so that the court has wider powers than all the other relief that you're asking for. And the last thing that you should put in any application or a statement of claim is parties shall be at liberty. What this sentence mean, means is in the course of the life of the suit, that the parties are free to file and ask for various kinds of relief. So these are the finer points of pleadings. Now let's move on to, remember we spoke about the main pleadings, uh, damages and so on. And then I said you must ask for interlocutory pleadings. For example, if you're asking for an injunction, what would you do? The first thing that you would think about is serious issues to be tried. You don't have to write that in your pleadings, but you have to be conscious of that. Serious issues to be tried. You have to say in your pleadings that the threat is imminent, that there is a threat of breach, that, or there is a breach already and the damages are there, that you're being prejudiced, it's imminent. It cannot be compensated by costs because the court will not give you an injunction if any damages that you suffer can be compensated in monetary terms. And then you have to speak about undertakings. Uh, you have to talk about the disclosures. You will be forced to make disclosures. You have to come to court with clean hands. You cannot be accused if you, dis if you fail to disclose some matters the defendant will say. You have not been truthful to the court. So you have to be very truthful. You have to disclose all the important points. For example, if you are asking for search orders, for example, Anton Pillar orders, there are procedures involved in Anton Pillar orders. You have to go and look for all these technicalities and put them in. Now let's come to the uh, causes of action. It's not a good idea to put very many causes of action in one set of pleadings. It tends to make the pleadings very long. The courts tend to get oppressed. They have to read a lot and the court may get lost in a thicket of details. So please don't go and file pleadings which are hundreds of pages long because nobody is going to read it because nobody has got the time least of all the judge be crisp be sharp be precise tell the court exactly why you want what you want and how much you want explain all the necessary facts now take for example a breach of contract the first thing that you have to say is this is a claim in contract for breach of contract and then you have to explain to the court in very brief terms, less than 20 words, what the contract is about. You might say, this was a contract for the conveyance and supply of cocoa or raw materials. Then you have to explain to the court what were the essential terms. And the terms that you're going to speak about must be essential. If the terms are merely breach of warranties, you can't ask for particular kind of damages or certain reliefs, relief are not afforded to you. So please be careful. The next thing that you want to speak about is you must straight away tell the court that there is a particular term and it is a fundamental, crucial term and put down the term straight away to that court and explain to the court why it's important. And then you must plead that the defendant breached this particular clause and then you must put particularize how he breached it and when you particularize there are two things that you have to do what the defendant should have done but did not do and secondly what is it that he did do which breached the contract so you have to particularize and you have to be very careful how you say it 
The next thing that people forget, most lawyers forget, and I have in my time struck out cases filed by very, very senior lawyers because they've forgotten to put in causation. So if you're filing a tortious claim, you must say, but for the breach of the defendant, the plaintiff would not have suffered losses. It's a but for test. Whereas for a breach of contract um, in Malaysia, it's Section 74. In England, it's Hadley and Baxendale. In other jurisdictions like Australia and New Zealand, there are equivalent tests. So if you are filing a claim for breach of contract, the first thing that you have to do is you have to tell the court that there was a causation. There is a link between the breach and the losses that you have suffered. And there are two kinds of losses that you could have suffered. One was the usual losses. Under the Hadley and Baxendale test, it must be something that naturally arose in the usual course of things from the breach. So you have to say the damages that the plaintiff has suffered Firstly, naturally arose. Secondly, in the usual course of things. Thirdly, from the breach. Sometimes the damages that your client as the plaintiff would have suffered would have been what are known as consequential damages. Remember the Victoria Laundry case? There the plaintiff was asked, asked the defendant to build a boiler to wash clothing. And the idea was, if this particular venture was successful, the plaintiff would get contracts from the armed forces, as a result of which the plaintiff intended to make greater profits. And this was informed to the defendant. There was a defect in the way they did it. And the plaintiff lost the contract and asked for consequential damages. And the question that arose was, did the defendant know at the time that he entered into the contract that the plaintiff was going to go and ask for extra work, or had already gotten extra work, and that they would use this particular boiler? If they knew about it and they were conscious of the fact that plaintiff would suffer that kind of damages, then if they breach the contract in making this boiler for the plaintiff, they have to pay extra damages known as consequential damages. But of course, if they didn't know at the time they made the contract, remember this, the knowledge of the defendant must be fixed at the time of the making of the contract, not afterwards. And the knowledge must be specific and material. Otherwise, you can't ask for consequential damages. The next thing that you have to do is you have to give details of the damages. For example, if you suffered losses as a result of asking the defendant to deliver cocoa to you, you have to show that you have paid so much money and that money could not be regained from the defendant, you had entered into a forward contract with someone else to resupply, and that cost you a certain sum of money that could not be recovered. And then you have to show that, for example, if you had to pay extra money for extra transportation in order to go and look for other sources of cocoa or the raw material, you have to specify. You just can't say, I want general damages and then throw the figure at the court, hoping that the court will sort it all out. The court is not obliged to do that. So you have to be very careful with your details. Don't overdo it, please, and put in 150 pages of details. Please use annexures at the back when you think it's more than 100 folios or 100 words then what you say to the court is the details of this are in annexure A to the statement of claim at the rear of the statement of claim and make it as simple as possible so that when the judge or the court read the statement of claim, it's easy to understand. It flows, it has momentum, 
it moves from course of action to course of action. Each course of action is broken down into its elements and for each of the elements all the relevant pleadings are there. Let me give you uh, another example. Suppose you were to plead a tortious action. You were, the plaintiff was passing by a construction site. One of the booms in the crane fell and injured his shoulder as a result of which he has lost the use of his right arm. The first thing that you would want to do is to plead A, the existence of the duty. Second, you would want to plead that there was a knowledge on the other side that this damage would occur if this particular act had occurred. So you have to look at the test after Caparo and Dickman in thought to look at the three or four elements in that case and plead it. The next thing that you have to do is to show that there is a breach of the duty and you have to provide particulars how the duty has been breached and then you have to plead causation. Remember I said in causation, um, in pleadings, in thought you have to say but for the negligence or default or breach of duty of the defendant, the plaintiff would not have suffered damages. If that one line is there, if you have a very clever defendant on the other side, they can strike you out. Then, of course, you have to give particulars of the breaches. Then you have to speak about the damages that you've suffered, break it into, um, subdivide it into special damages, general damages. Your client was carrying a computer worth US $1,750. It fell, it broke, it, it is completely unusable. Put up the details. He was wearing a particular watch, Timex watch. It cost US $250. Put that down in every other detail of specific damages. Then move on to general damages and classify the different kinds of general damages. Sometimes you would want to plead illegality. A contract may have become illegal then you can't ask for post-breach damages. You have to ask for damages which will require restitio in integrum, where the parties are put in the original positions that they were. Then you have to think about Section 66 in Malaysia, or Singapore, if you're in the Contracts Act, where the parties have to be restored to the original position. Any money is paid over has to be repaid. You have to think about these things. Now, suppose you have a claim where you've suffered damages, for example, in a breach of contract, and there are two parts to it. One is, you, you're confident you can get summary judgment on, and the other requires a full trial. So what do you do? In your pleadings, you subdivide the claim of that part of the claim that is easy to go for summary judgment and put out the details very carefully and say at the end of it, there is no defense at all from the defendant. Put out the exact sum of money that you are asking. Show where this comes from. And then go to the second portion of the damages, which has to be proven at the end of the trial. Say so. This will be shown at the end of the trial. And then lay it all out. So that when you go for a summary judgment, you can just copy and paste that part of your statement of claim into your summary judgment claim. Now, please be mindful of the defenses the other side will take. The other side might claim or plead limitation. The other side might plead frustration. The other side might plead force majeure. When they plead, then when you file a reply, make sure that you plead in your reply that the limitation argument is not right, that in fact the court cannot consider it. Why? Go and study the law of limitation. One particular rule of limitation is when the other side acknowledges the claim beyond the six years and agrees to pay, then time continues to run. The second reason is there are different periods of limitations for different breaches of duty. So if you are involved in a land case, 
then that would have a longer limitation. If you are involved in a trust case, sometimes the question is there is no limitation. And these are the things that you have to think about. If you have suffered other than monetary damages, these are known as other prejudice. The only way that the court can compensate you is by giving you monetary terms in compensation and therefore explain what are the losses you've suffered, what is your prejudice and then plead that you want general damages for that. It's only at the end if you look at the first point that we looked at, remember we said look at the uh, relief, it's only at the end that you are required to think about which is the court that can give you an injunction. In the old days in our country, the lower courts, the subordinate courts could not grant an injunction. And if we wanted an injunction, we've ha we had to go to the high court. So if you're in Australia, or in New Zealand, or in Hong Kong, or in India, or in any of the common law jurisdictions all across the world, determine which court can give you the kind of damages or the relief you're asking. And if the court cannot give you, the subordinate courts cannot give you, then there's no point in filing an action in the subordinate courts. Sometimes the claim is less than a minor sum of money. For example, US 1000. Then you can't file it in the subordinate courts as well. You have to go to the consumer court. So be mindful of these things and be very careful how you deal with the, the pleadings because a pleadings will break you or make you. And the pleadings are most important when you're arguing your case in the Supreme Court, at the highest court. The court will look at whether elements have been pleaded. We spoke about the statement of claim. I now speak about the defences. The same principles apply. If you think that you're not liable, you have to explain why you're not liable. If you think you've been sued for a breach of statutory duty, you have to say that the defendant did not owe a duty. If he did owe, he did discharge it and did it reasonably and any damages or prejudice suffered was beyond your control and so on and so forth. If you are pleading a defense against a defamation suit, then you have to either decide that you're going to accept that you have defamed the plaintiff, in which event you have to concede, or sometimes you have to say, no, I had a right to make these statements. I had a defense of fair comment and lay out all the elements of the facts relating to fair comment. I had uh, made that statement in a statement of, uh, in, in a circumstance of qualified privilege and lay it all out. You must say, I was justified in making the statement because it was true and explain why it was true so that when the court reads, the court will know that there are details and that the details are correct. You see, what will happen sometimes is people fill up their pleadings with all sorts of rubbish. They will tell a story, they will go round and round. Please don't do that. Pleadings must be short, sharp, precise, arranged, they must have momentum. There must be a flow. You must move from point to point to point, from one defense to another defense to another defense. We now come on to other points like the counterclaim. When you are pleading a counterclaim, then you have to plead it in exactly the same way as I said in relation to a statement of claim, except that you will say defense and counterclaim right at the top then you do all your defenses. Right at the defense, you must say, counterclaim, and then you say, I repeat and adopt all the statements above by way of counterclaim, and then set out your counterclaim and put out the elements and ask. And at the end of your counterclaim or your defense, you must say, I ask for a declaration for this. I ask for the claim to be dismissed. I ask for that, this, and the other, and you ask for cause either on a party and party basis or on a solicitor client basis. Remember, this, as I leave, I tell you this. The pleadings will be helpful in two places. One, during trial. 
because if you get stuck you can open your pleadings and you can cross-examine an opponent's witness just using your pleadings if you're stuck during cross-examination of a plaintiff's witness and you are a defendant you can open your counterclaim or a defense and cross-examine them step by step and the court can keep up and finally when you end up before the supreme court or the federal court or the highest appellate court the courts will basically look at what you've asked for and what you're asking on appeal and whether the two things dovetail. So whenever you do a pleading, make sure that you think about what's going to happen on appeals and whether your pleadings will dovetail with any appeal that your defendant or your opponent might take up. So these are the valid points that you have to think about. What I have done is I have written an essay on it in my website called Paradox. It's in gkg.legal. Please like this video. Please subscribe. And that's it. We've come to the end. Have a good day.